today we're going to talk, get into more of the meat of the matter with some examples of scope and, and fee, although we're not going to dive in in that much detail, because I did a little thinking about what we're doing here. You know, we're doing two hours a month, plus whatever outside time, like the reading. And so, you know, each one of these could be a whole day of session in itself. And by the time we're done, we're going to have, you know, seven sessions or whatever it's times two. So we don't even have the equivalent of two days. So I think everybody has to understand we're scratching the surface on a lot of this. <clears throat> but I also think that everybody has enough experience that the dots get connected. And so when you see these things, you're able to relate them because you're experienced to things you're doing and, and get more than more than two hours out of them because a lot of it you probably can self teach yourself as, as you go. So what I thought we'd start today is a little, um, a couple things. One is a recap of, of last time around. And so in our last session, we talked about project management and what makes a successful project manager. And what, what is a project manager? And we had this chart which matched very closely to a lot of the things that all of you identified on the, on the um, flip charts. So from initiation, planning and design, executing, monitoring, controlling, and closing the project out. And then we also talked about, so that's, we talked about that, and we also talked about um, including the scope, budget, schedule, quality, the risk involved in the job, and all those things fall under the umbrella of project management. And then we talked about effective use of our resources and situational leadership. And that's um, probably a good segue just to this next little piece that everybody was giving this book. If you didn't read it, don't tell me. You know, I'm just going to assume everybody read it. Um, if you haven't, it's, I, I think I was honest when I said it's a simple way to read. Um, it goes pretty fast. And, and it's, it's easy enough to read that it's kind of fun to read. It's amazing how a guy can write in almost a third grade style and yet give you a really strong message for the things you do in a complicated workplace. So the reason that we suggested this book is because it has a little bit of, of a tie to how you use your resources and and how you can get more from your people, that you can enjoy your work more, and how you can help develop them. It's not just about getting stuff. So what what things did you guys get out of this book? Is there anything in particular you can share that, that you got out of it? Raising this crazy house growth. Okay. That was simple. In regards to like like the goal, just making sure you know what your goal is. You don't have to like draw it out. It's just to be this is what it is. And as long as you know how to like be clear about it, that's all you need. That was the easy part. And then the other one is positive phrase makes sense and then the redirect. It was just all very simple. I think I think you just nailed the three real takeaways though. So it's and it's always his phraseology is one minute. Not to say it's really one minute, but that it's quick. A one minute goal. So setting goals and reviewing them and adjusting them if you need to. But setting goals and sharing them with others that are party whether it's your supervisor or, or someone else that everybody's bought into the goal. And then there's the one minute praising. They always write it about people want to feel good about what they're doing and all that. I always viewed it as if you tell somebody they did something good, they might do it again. You know, and, and then the last thing is the one minute redirect and that's sort of if somebody's on the wrong path that we help set them straight again. And it could be because of direction or it could be just because they don't understand what they're doing. That used to be called in his original version this reprimand. But I think in the politically correct world, redirect sounds so much nicer. <clears throat> the other thing that I um, get out of this is, is when he's talking to the new one-minute manager, the guy who sends him out to talk to people, is that he's interested in two things. Remember what those two things are? Results and people. Yeah. Results and people. So if you're interested in people, the results hopefully come because you're doing all the right things. But it's not just that you can be interested in people only. We have to connect it to the business side of what we're doing. So 
Um, have you, um, as you read that, could you think of things you're doing already, or that you're not doing, that you, you know, or, or things you that you are doing that you should stop doing? You know, there's usually the, those three categories fall in. So I don't know if there's any anything in particular anybody wants to share. I think uh, just like mentoring with the Gallus and Jack down in San Diego. I think. Sometimes I'll ask them a question and I'll, I'll kind of answer it for them. And now, like after reading the book, I, the last couple of days, I'm kind of letting them come to the conclusion before I say something. So, and most of the time they come out and answer it, right? So it's just basically yeah. yeah. My takeaway is like, to me, it's just empowering the, uh, the people who are working for you, uh, kind of. A certain degree. Uh, I relate it to somewhat to my tennis as well. But, uh, it's just kind of just uh, something that I thought of when I was reading it as well. It's like you know, uh, you want them to perform to their to the best that they can possibly uh, perform at, and the only way they can do that is through positive uh, feedback and, and kind of just like uh, allowing them to freely kind of do what they. Or people of doing. Yeah, I think that's good because in the book, it's not, this isn't all about the workplace. So, applying it to tennis or in your home life with your family or your friends, there's a lot of things you can do to enhance how relationships work and how people can deliver more together. So, I, I always like this book, and the rewrite still has the same feeling that, that I think the original one did, and it's easy to keep that with you. And, and actually put this stuff into practice without any phenomenal concept or rocket science. So, um, so that's all I wanted to do. Is there is there anything? Wait, one last thing. Is there anything you're doing that maybe you shouldn't be doing? When you read this. You might have hit on it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I think that's probably more along the lines of redirect. I think. Uh, I mean, I you know obviously do catch things, but then maybe I follow through with like the, the positive. Yeah, there's probably this thing too where we give too much direction. Mm -hmm. You want to take it into every little detail, and all of a sudden you're bogged down in it. So it has two things: one, it kills your time, and two, the person on the other end might be inside their head going, "I got it," you know. And so we have, you got to make people feel like they're growing and doing things. So also when you uh, when you redirect, it's not about the uh, person; it's about the behavior, but you value. That's an excellent point. And that's really true with everything. I'm really glad you raised that because um, in anything, somebody gets upset, a client, um, we talk about this a lot, Travis and I, but I never take that personal. It's more about the situation <laughs> and the event that's occurring or the behavior that's going on, not, not um, directed at me, but there's something bigger there, and so I just try to deal with facts and try to have a rational solution to things. Otherwise, you'd be mad at somebody all the time because there's always going to be something out there that... And sometimes when a client is unreasonable about it, we can be off the call and hang up and almost laugh about it, that, wow, we really get upset about this, but you know we're not going to let it. We're going to deal with the facts, we're going to deliver the goods and not not to make it personal. I think that's a huge thing. Okay, so um, I think we can move on to what we're going to talk about today, and Peter and I are going to share a lot of this today. And so I'm gonna, I want to start off with, because um, the topic today is, well, I'll let that out, but we talked about it later. Um, talk about what is the scope and why is the scope important. Um, so why, why, what is the scope why is important? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Guideline. It's your guideline. Let me write this down. But. I mean, if you give direction but. as to what it is that your goals are measured. You know, probably here's the good for Sylvia. I'm okay. Okay, so. I 
one. Can you say something, Stuart? Boundary. Boundary? Yeah, everything has to be limited. change that, I might have the word agree flashing in lights because it's what we agree to perform. We're, we're, it's, we're being binded to doing that. That's the expectation and that's legally what we've agreed to do. It defines the limits of our responsibility. Stuart, you had boundaries, I think you nailed it. And I'd say versus that of others. And when we start getting into clarifications and assumptions, that's where we maybe can hit the second half of that. Um, it's always the default item to check. So what does that mean? Well, um, change orders. If you say, I need a change order, what's the first thing before somebody is going to okay it? Well, what's in your scope? Right, so it becomes the default item for any disagreement, conversation like that. And it also, um, it becomes a dis the issue in disputes. So if somebody says, um, hey, that uh, such and such isn't functioning right out there. And you guys designed whatever you did and we're having problems with that valve or whatever it is. The first thing you're going to do is go back to the office and go, hmm, is that in our scope? What are we supposed to do? And so it's, it's a default item. And in a legal battle, if you're sued or if there's anything like that, the scope, believe me, that is like the first, that's exhibit A out on the table about what was everybody obligated to do. So it's not just, yeah, I'm trying to see what I can do for this guy and get a fee for it. It's we're, we're stepping out with some responsibility and accountability when we, when we do that. So um, you're not gonna win a case without being able to show that it's not in your scope or it was clearly in somebody else's scope or you know however, however the results are for that. So, um, Let's talk about um, how you develop a scope work. Because it takes a little bit of homework. You don't just, you know, maybe if you do the same thing for the same person over and over again, it's easy to pull the last one out. But even then there's homework. You know, what's different about the property? Or what's different about this, um, you know, this, the existing conditions here? Why, why might this change? So you've got to do your homework and you've got to understand, um, you have to understand <clears throat> One, what's the client's goals? So if a client is, let's say, developing, he has a piece of property, and he wants to get approvals on the property, um, we might not write a scope of work that has, well, here's how we get the approval, and then we're going to design the final plans, and then we're going to do that, because he's like, well, I'm selling it after, after I get the approvals. And so we would want to understand, you know, what. What's, what are their goals and what's their timing goals? Because timing goals might impact our scope too. Certain things might be out of order and we might have to do extra things to, to meet that timing. So if we don't understand the client's goals, we're gonna have a difficult time serving them and, and defining what we're gonna do. The jurisdiction that we're in, what are the requirements? So, you know, from the city of LA versus city of something else versus the unincorporated county territory, that's one thing. The second half of that, well, how else could that be influenced? Jurisdictional things. So, like, maybe there's a Caltrans influence in it. A 
besides the local, or maybe there's a water district influence or another utility interest. So we have to understand all the jurisdictional or the the regional board, things like that. So we want to understand what the jurisdictions are that are going to be impacted. I, only, I did start to use the word all, but we're going to come to the word all a little later. Some, sometimes we we'll have uh, names for those. We we'll call it Caltrans factor or CDLA factor yeah. or law factor. What, what that is commonly said is that different agency for the same job, you cannot be in the same number of hours between the agencies. You need to factor in city or lay factor. <laughs> that's what that's what that bullet is about. <laughs> right, and you might have a city. So say, take something like a city of LA or another one. It might be well, the city requirements are this, but then you also know that the city of, of such and such never buys off on something unless you get the community group to be okay with it. So you have to know those things so you can scope that part, or clearly say you're not doing it, or ask the client, hey, who's taking care of that? Because you're going to that I think you know deal with the community so it's really important to understand um, what those what those um, influences are other agencies and that's kind of where I was talking about regional board or um, any others you see um, the other thing is what are other team members doing there's some times where you overlap in scope and they're like no we're already handling that here so simple examples would be you have a parking lot site lighting Who's doing the site lighting? Well, a lot of times we can just spec a light from somewhere. No, our electrical guy's handling that. So it's, it's important to know that. Or, well, I thought the electrical guy's handling that. No, I thought you guys were going to do that. So that's where all these questions for your client come in. Or at least if they're unable to discuss it with you, to be able to clearly articulate what you are and are not doing. And I don't like to just tell them we're not doing this. If I think they need it, I'll say, um, especially if you're trying to control your fee, you might say it doesn't include this or put it as an optional item with a separate fee because you don't want to be compared to the competition that's leaving them all out if they didn't clearly articulate what they want. We'll talk more about that as we develop the scope, but the key there is to ask questions. So you want to meet with the client, get questions answered. Depending on the type of client it is, you might have to do it through a more formal procedure with RFIs. Um, you know, I can tell you that I don't, I don't think we're going to get this job because they haven't called us. Uh, but at West Covina, they had this last go around with the, the um, street rehabilitation. And I'm looking at this thing, and it's got this monstrous area. And yet, they have a budget that, based on our experience, covers about this much. That's about how far their money would go. So then I was like, do you want to do a preliminary on the whole area? Do you want to do only the testing here? Do you want to do it? And so all those questions resulted in, that we asked, resulted in them issuing an amendment to everybody, which probably is how other guys lowballed it on the job. But, um, but it would have been bad for us to put a proposal on that as it was written, because it was it would have been a million dollar proposal when they have, you know, 100,000, something like that. So it's really, uh, clients are not offended when you ask questions. It clarifies ambiguous items and it prevents us from leaving things out we're adding too much. Sometimes we're too smart and we scope our way right out of the job, you know, for everything that could possibly occur. So, um, so I know Peter, you had some thoughts on those last two things there about, you know, what is a good scope? It's yeah. So my my uh, point there is a good scope needs to be written needs to be comprehensive. You gotta consider all of those things above. Um, and it needs to flow from A to Z kinda in a more uh, simple logical way and needs to be concise. You know, so you, so things are said in a more straightforward way as supposed to be uh, you know you, you, you got a survey, talk about survey here and later you talk about survey again type of things. Make sure it's uh, all, all uh, Coherent. Uh, another thing that I was uh, wanted to put out there is that uh, sometimes we need to know our own limit. Uh, we write the scope proposal. If a certain area that you are not familiar with, uh, you gotta go out there and look for help. Uh, start with all the internal resources first, 
and then go outside. For example, uh, when the scope has a uh, environmental clearance, uh, when we, we, if we don't have a whole process on the stand on, on, on there, you gotta figure out what, what that is, right? Recently, we'll talk about the federal process. It's a federal funded project. Uh, if you've never done a federal funded project, there's a little bit of uh, uh, knowledge needs to be brought forward. Uh, so we, we, we want to make sure that the individual we project manager that we have uh, understanding of their own limitations. <clears throat> Good. So here, before we, before we um, get into this next slide in any detail, I'm just going to put that heading out. But, and plus everybody's sitting here looking like they might drift off. Um, it's a good time to break break up into a couple of groups and do a little thinking. And what, I, what I'd like you to do is, you know, we put a proposal together and we have all the scope items in there. And then, um, then we're looking at, well, how did we arrive at those things and how do we develop our assumptions? So we have assumptions that we make in developing a scope. So if we could break up into a couple of groups now and identify some of the typical assumptions that you see when we're putting a proposal together. Uh, so uh, the first one we have listed here is just you know, who, who provides the survey information, um, the prime, the, the owner, uh, that's kind of an assumption we kind of make sometimes in the proposals. Uh, the common one we find is, you know, who takes care of the permitting other clients that by the designers, uh, by contractors. Uh, and we always kind of assume that the as built information, sufficient as built information, will be provided by the municipality, agency, whatever it may be. Uh, and then here, you know, I think this is more along the lines of interdisciplinary responsibilities uh, to find the boundaries between subs. There's going to be interdisciplinary assumptions between different subs. Who's going to be kind of like what Rick was saying earlier about who does what, you know, specifically um, in, in, the, in the whole overall project scope. Uh, and then uh, also another part is, you know, who will be providing the, um, the specs, uh, not not really the technical specs, but you know, the boilerplate, the general specs, uh, is that provided by the agency, is it provided by us? Uh, and then, you know, another assumption that's made is, you know, your overall schedule, um, not, not only just the, the design schedule, but including the, uh, the review schedule, and the review period. So those are the ones we can uh, immediately think of. Okay, thanks. Who's gonna take the lead here? Okay, so we obviously had some of the ones that were mentioned over there, but some of the ones we use or have used in the past and permitting fees. A lot of the times, we want to make sure that we exclude. I guess these are ex assumptions and exclusions. We should probably start with that. We're excluding permitting fees because sometimes that could be very, I mean, it could be very expensive. Geotechnical, there's a lot of liability with geotech, so we don't like to technically have that under our contract. So we assume that the client will provide, will, the geotech will provide, be contracted directly with the client. Stormwater, if it's a stormwater project, then you obviously have to do that. But if it's not, you assume that no storm water is going to be needed and they come back and say you know we are going to need it that could be a big, big dollar item same with modeling that could be water modeling assume that we're not going to include that or it's going to be excluded it could be water modeling it could be bin modeling with civil 3d revit all that it could that those are big dollar items hazmat um, support if there's has if there's hazardous asbestos if there's asbestos or wet paint or Hopefully the client has already secured the services of someone that's going to either abate that or take that out. We're not going to be dealing with that. Exclusions. Existing utility development, I think that's based, basically the same thing as the as-built information. Who's going to provide the as-builds? Are they accurate? 
most of the times they're not. <laughs> so uh, there's other items that fall into the line of like you're either the clients either if they want to do underground investigation then they're gonna secure that so that would be an assumption that they would do or that we would provide or that they would provide us with the information dry utility design a lot of times clients some they'll want us to include dry utilities such as gas electric um, we can show it on our plans but it's then sometimes when they show it on our plans, they're expecting us to design it. And that's something we don't typically do. Uh, construction, we don't build things. Installing, same thing we install. Submittal schedule, typically the milestones are provided by the client, so we assume that those are going to be provided. If not, we would make, we would extend the schedule out if, if we didn't have the work um, at the time. Design package, I'm not really sure what we meant about that. Um, so, Katie, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. Well, you know, it'll depend on the type of work, or it depends on, you know, uh, uh, the complexity of uh, your scope of work. Um, you know, civil work, you know, probably you don't worry about the design package. But, you know, for uh, uh, a real change project, you know, yeah. it involves, you know, so many uh, disciplines, okay? Mm -hmm. Probably you know, also the design package also you know, try to simple work too. You know, if you have uh, you know uh, water issue, you have you know, uh, traffic issue, you have uh, uh, geotechnical issue. You know, so those kind of things that, that uh, sometimes you know um, uh, the country also you know uh, you want to, you want to come up with reviewers, so you will divide you know the design package you know, into uh, different kind of categories. So that's that one. Uh, one thing that we find kind of difficult is assuming a certain amount of submittals because you may have a client that can change, get rigs dealing with one, with one group. But if you assume a certain amount of submittals, say 50, 90 on final, then technically if they are asking for more, I mean that, there's dollar values that go into that. So assuming submittals, the, the amount of submittal sampling, stormwater sampling, anything like that, that gets really labor intensive if that's not is excluded. So uh, this could be anything. Um, for instance, we had a project at Naval Base San Diego where we had to uh, assume a design wave load, I think it was, for uh, the thing for the pipe we were designing. That wasn't available in any as-built information, so we had to assume that. Well, that actually wasn't really the contract. That was after we were designing, but it's still an assumption that can impact the So um, those are all good things. Obviously, you guys have had experience with these things, but let me let me give you a, a, some additional perspective on it. And there's a few things here that will be <clears throat> redundant. Um, oftentimes, we're doing something. I know in a highway or in anything that our design is in conformance with a study or or an exhibit that was provided by the client. Because if they have some fatal flaw in what they did that we're not aware of, and it, rises later, we want to make sure that we've pinned that responsibility back on them. Topographic, you guys have that. Um, if we did surveying, I would, I would look for a way to take that in. And the other thing is, depending on the client you're working with, you don't always want to say, we're not going to do that, we're not going to do that, we're not going to do that, especially if you know it needs to be done. So if we know they got to do utility modeling, we don't want to exclude it. But we also, if they're going to four different guys and nobody else realizes it, we want to be clever about how we exclude it. So, you know, we might say utility for, you know, water modeling has not been included in this, but we suspect it may be required. We provided an optional fee for that item below or something like that. So we're keeping the apples and apples created, but we're also marketing and trying to expand our services. So it's not, we don't, we don't want to just not do everything. We want to look for things we can do. But we also don't want to take high liability things. I heard you guys talk about geotech. We don't want to take high liability things under our wing unless we have to. We have to on public projects where we're prime. We don't have a choice. You know, we have a Navy contract, if we have a um, LA Metro, and they say, you're selected, and you got to put geotech under you. You can't say, no, I'll hire them separate. You, you have to do it. But if you're working for a design builder, 
you can say, I, really, I will coordinate the proposal and do everything to make it easy for you, but I need you to contract directly with them. So we're looking for those kinds of assumptions. We might even say, we will help you um, get your proposal and facilitate getting them on board, but we would ex the assumption is that you're going to contract directly with them. So, and also, the timing of those things. It doesn't do any good to say Topo's provided by others. And they say, okay, get started. It's like, oh, I meant now, before we start. So we might have to say, before consultants can begin work, or something like that. Um, limit the meeting time. I got some examples I'm going to share with you some of this stuff. <clears throat> but um, we attend meetings. What does that mean? How do you put a number to that? So we might need to define in our assumptions that, or in our scope item, might not show in our assumptions, but somewhere we have to define what we're doing. Limit agency processing time. We were talking about submittal packages. That's fine if you're working for the government. They have defined packages. You know, every city, county, federal, whatever, they're all like 30, 60, 90, whatever they want. But if you're doing a, a private development, who are you submitting to? You're submitting to the agency who is no longer the proponent of the project. They're the plan checker. Some might say they're the obstacle, right? And if, what happens if you have 14 submittals? They're on you if you're not making your changes right. You've got to get it in. You've got to make the thing, the corrections. You've got to get them to approve it. Now, if they're not approving it because they change requirements, that's different. Now you can stop, raise your hand, and say, whoa, 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 they're asking for something that's no longer a good thing. Now, um, I'm going to talk about fees. So, Peter, you want to hold that? Okay. You want to oh, yeah, yeah. hand me this? Before I get into specific uh, pieces, uh, preparing fee is the hardest thing an engineer or a project manager uh, will do in terms of getting the project going. Uh, because uh, you really are trying to, trying to uh, predict the future and trying to uh, uh, also gauge against uh, what the client's perspective is. And uh, most importantly, you're trying to gauge what the competitors can do. And uh, gauging what the competitors can do, that's just uh, very hard. That's <laughs> very hard thing to do. Uh, but there is uh, some uh, general guidelines that would go by uh, to, to do the, uh, uh, the fee preparations. Uh, in terms of principles, I mean, the, the fee is where you, the compositions that uh, were expected. If you don't present that information properly, uh, if that's not in line with your scope, uh, obviously uh, you don't have a good business to start with the project. Uh, scope and the fee are twins. Uh, if you're talking the fee, if you don't talk the scope, or if you talk about scope, you have a fee, you're, you're just not talking the same thing. These two things has to come together, always side by side. Whenever somebody asks for a fee, you gotta you know, we talk about you know that already. What exactly has to be done in terms of scope, right? Once the scope is developed, and that gives you ability to develop fee. So fee always comes after you have a little bit more clarity of the scope. So how is the fee are kind of uh, prepared? Um, I, I listed a few things here. Let me just start by doing showing you this. This is a document that uh, I got a hold of uh, uh, many years ago. Uh, I I haven't really researched whether or not there's a newer version of this. This is a study that uh, was done uh, multiple agencies, including the city of Los Angeles. They did a survey on different type of work, for example, street and the bridge work. And this charts out the size of the project 
in terms of dollars. Also chart, chart out the percentage of the construction dollar in terms of the fee they paid for consultants. Um, and there's a different type of work. They, they have uh, data collected, and, uh, and that would be the background you can look at. Now, if you look at it in a general sense, uh, people often say, okay, 10% of construction dollars is uh, what's supposed to be our fee. But that's just a very vague, large scale uh, thinking. Uh, it could be more, it could be less. Another thing is that the agencies, they have the different allocation of, of the fees for, based on the construction dollars. Uh, it depends on the agency too. Like for example, Caltrans. Yeah, when we're doing Caltrans uh, a federal funded project, the guideline says they allocate 25% of construction dollars as uh, engineering and another 25% as construction management. So you're talking about a big chunk of uh, budget allocated for the soft cost. Uh, for the uh, Navy work that we often look at, right, they already told you that uh, your hard design cost has to be 6% of the construction. Maximum. Maximum. And then whatever the preliminary design, the survey, the geotech uh, is a, a different uh, bucket. Now if you add those two up, you usually come up to like 10% plus or minus, it depends on the complexity of things. Um, you know, when we look at the, the design fee, uh, we got to have little sense of what percentage of construction. That's one of the uh, metrics that we go through to, to uh, check, check uh, if we're in the ballpark, right? Uh, uh, KD will tell you for a large transit project, uh, if you're talking 10%, you're just way out of mind. You don't know what you're talking about. Maybe you're looking at 6%, 7%. 8% hardly you can be able to get 8%, right? But if you're looking at seismic retrofit or building retrofit or modification, your fee could be 30%, 40% rate. Uh, it couldn't be even more. The, the engineer fee could be more than the construction cost. Uh, but if you're looking at a larger scale of the project, uh, you know, consider a fairly standard uh, 9, 10%, those are kind of the range that we, we, we typically are trying to target to. Um, that's where experience and, uh, and, and uh, 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 knowledge of the market comes in. Uh, another thing that the percentage wise, uh, in terms of uh, administrative portion of the cost, you know, that's a project manager important. You know, how, how is that stacked up against the rest of the cost? People always think that you gotta stay about 10% in, in, in my view. Sometimes you gotta go lower, sometimes you go higher, depends on. 10% uh, of the overall cost is where your starting point needs to be and, and go from there. So the other matrix is uh, hours per sheet, which we do all the time. I, I think that would be the first step you go through the fee estimate, it goes through the hour breakdowns. You, you already have like a, the Port of Long Beach proposal, you have this uh, uh, works breakdown structure. Uh, you got to anticipate the who are the expertise to, to, to do this work on a spreadsheet. And you lay out how many hours specifically you need to, to uh, use for those tasks and then flush it through based on, based on the hours. And that translates into uh, overall hour per sheet. And uh, from that information, let's say you have uh, 50 sheets uh, for this particular project, you, you look at your total hours, and you should be able to equate to how many hours per sheet in, in general. Uh, hour per sheet also, there's uh, some uh, uh, industry standards as well. Uh, if you look at the Caltrans project, uh, for example, they have guidelines in the cultural minimal design. That's the only place I think they publish those things. Uh, based on the construction dollar, based on the, they give you hours per 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 sheet and that kind of situation. Again, hour per sheet in the general sense, you are talking about hundred hour per sheet. Uh, KD, right? Depends on again, but that's a good starting point always. You move up and down from from that is the larger scale you ended up with as in less as 50 hours per sheet. 
I think the Navy, uh, NASA, they, in the general sense, they're looking for much less than 100 hour per sheet. And that's what I was told by, by, uh, by the, in the past. I mean, that's where 6% is kind of related really well to uh, the design dollar. It depends on the kind of work you're doing. You know, one sheet of a water line looks a lot different than one sheet of a freeway. The effort that goes into it, so you have to yeah. weigh that out. Right. Yeah, you agree that email was also you know, tied the hours needed you know, to the number of submitters. Correct. And the QC required. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. and those two things really, not right now, check out you know, the yeah. hours, mm -hmm. right. uh, expenditure for the mm -hmm. Yeah, like I said, the, the proper thing to do is to work out your scope and the work out your uh, uh, work breakdown structure, which it has all the submittals, has all the uh, steps that is required, and then you you populate the hours based on experience, and that's that that should be always the first step, and then back into the total number of hours per sheet, and then to look at the, the percentage of construction, uh, and that's how. You know, it, 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 uh, I always uh, proceed with that. Uh, in the end of that process, you have to go back to the competition, right? <laughs> the market and the competition. You gotta know who's your competitors are and gauge are uh, this guy's traditionally a low ball uh, firms or this is uh, a larger firms that, that they they go by the standard market, and you you kind of know where you're fitting into into that uh, kind of uh, scenario. Peter, you know, may I, you know, add, you know, mm -hmm. here you're talking about, a, you know, kind of final design, right? But yeah. I think that they come down, you know, to the type of the work, mm -hmm. you know, right? Uh, um, either it's a lump sum or it's a time material, because they have a different strategy, okay? Um, and particularly right now, you know, we want to do the so-called management, okay? So on the management program, you don't have those kind of guidelines for you, okay? Right. Mm -hmm. So the principle is, M high and uh, <laughs> reduce, okay? Uh, why? Because it's all psychology, all right? That you know, clients, you know, will be happy that I reduce the scope, I reduce the fee for you for the same scope. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah, yeah. All right. That's true. Well, uh, we're going to talk about negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sticker shop <laughs> is, is, a, is one of the ways to, to do that. So in terms of how the project is going to come together in the end, in terms of the fee, there's different type of uh, contracts where you are pursuing the lump sum fixed fee that uh, KT just mentioned. Uh, once you're, you know, gone through the negotiation, everything, everything wrapped into a, a total cost. Uh, unless there's a very agreeable change orders, you're not going to get anything more. And that's, that's how it works. Fixed cost per uh, scope item is uh, also similar to lump sum in the bigger picture, but this is kind of a little bit of breakdown, get a little bit more uh, clarity on each item uh, for the clients to manage, for us to manage too. But, he, but actually, it's uh, also a lump, lump sum kind of a scenario. Uh, where I like those things personally because it's easier to process from an administrative standpoint. <laughs> uh, there's good and there's bad, but... <laughs> but the next one is always the time and the material. Time and material is that uh, you've got to have to report your, your, your time expenditure per task based on the uh, work's uh, breakdown structure. Uh, and the client is going to approve your, your invoices and cost accordingly. Now, time and the material not exceed, obviously, there's a cap. Uh, that's, I think most of the clients are the ones that do that. They, they give you time and material so they can control your, your process. At the same time, they put a hat on you so you can't really go over. Uh, for those scenarios, uh, typically what you have to do is to, before you get to 80%, 85% the range, uh, you're gonna have to engage the client smartly and see what that implication is and and, and then take that uh, step forward. Uh, what is cost plus? Cost plus is also similar to time and material, except there's no uh, no uh, 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 not exceed exceed. 
cos plus uh, uh, could uh, have another variation, cos plus of the fixed phi too. Cos plus means you just build your cost based on the readable uh, markup or profit margin within it. Uh, now cos plus with a fixed phi is, is uh, where you, your cost can be passed through to the client always, but you can only earn so much of fixed amount of uh, profit, that's the fee part of it. Um, a lot of time we're working, I think, between this and this. Just two. Yeah, one, one thing that might make it very little, you could have time and material, and it could be per an, I'll call it artificial fee schedule that we created. So you can make a specific fee schedule for that client. It could be city, we're going to charge you this much for an engineer, this much for an administrator, that, you know, whatever those things are, and you're billing at those rates, time and material. Usually anything that's cost plus specifically is going to go to the exact rate of each person touching the job. So that's where, um, yeah. that's why it's on the bottom of the list because it's the most painful yeah. to do. But really you run into that anyway in a lot of yeah. transportation work yeah. because they go with actual rates. Right. And maybe they go fix, but they arrive at it through blended rate discussion. Mm -hmm. So again, you're dealing with one or two rates per engineer and a support person in engineering. Mm -hmm. And you just figure, well, the three guys I have on it come out close to average to that rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a very good point. Uh, that maybe it should be there. Is that the rate that the way you charge the client on any specific project uh, is up to us to present what kind of rate we're gonna work on this project. We could use a different set of rates for different projects given you know, the circumstances. Um, so this is a project engineer. For project number one, we present at the rate of $130 per hour. That does not mean that you could not use a project engineer for next job to charge the client $150 per hour. And those kind of decisions, the individual project manager needs to make those decisions, you know, perhaps, you know, in consultation with the management, right? Um, but however, some contracts, you have no choice. Because the cost, that you have to report the actual cost of your, your staff. The only thing they want to renegotiate is your profit margin, 8%, 8.5%. You guys have yeah. a hard time to yeah. negotiate 10% out of that back. But yeah. <laughs> well, the idea is to get all their money, no matter what you call the numbers. Right, right. That's where, so for those the hours yeah, for those cases, you kind of work with the hours. There's two, two parts of the equation. Um, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, we'll cover this, some of this. Okay, work breakdown structure. Work breakdown structure uh, depends on type of work. Some agencies have a rigorous uh, work breakdown structure. For example, Caltrans, they have a whole book for it, right? For uh, uh, cities, uh, even NAFAG, I don't think that has a really defined work, work breakdown structure. So work breakdown structure would be up to us to develop according to scope. You know, it started off uh, uh, field investigation, started with survey, preliminary engineering, hydraulic studies. You break it down however it fits your situation, that would become a project specific work breakdown structure. Um, which, which needs to be consistent with, with what they need. Be clear on the team, uh, what is going to perform the work, uh, which one, we we'll talked about those already. Uh, we, you know, in your scope, you, you need to be clear which one's in, which one's not uh, part of your scope. And also which people you're going to have on the job, so you know how to assign a value to that line item. Right, yeah, exactly, that's the one here. Um, I think a common thing that we kind of, uh, have in, in, in my past is that we have too many columns. For one task, we, we spread it out like a two hours here, four hours there. And by the time we spread it out, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, sometimes uh, it's better off to 
really think through how many different type of uh, uh, staff you need for this particular task and uh, stay with that. Uh, and, and then sign up appropriate way. We just talked about rate. The rate is something you have to engage in the holistic view of the competitions, of what you want to achieve, and how do you want to execute this project. You want to build up a little bit more uh, margin on these particular areas or less. Uh, a common thing people always look into is uh, principles, charge rate. If you look at everybody, every com company's uh, standard rate, you would always say, always see that the principal charge rate is really low. <laughs> it's not reflective uh, because they wanted to contain the impression of it. Uh, oftentimes, the design engineer's rate is a little bit higher because that's where the margin is made. So those kind of things is uh, in line with how, however you wanted to uh, really tell uh, a structure or frame this particular project from a business standpoint. Uh, we'll talk about submittals and uh, reviews, uh, and this this uh, needs to be uh, clearly delineated, so we don't uh, miss the big gaps. Like the port of uh, Long Beach, uh, our original scope started like the first submit was 15 percent. When so we get into it, so you know, we don't want to do 15 percent, we want to do 30 percent. We sold up something through all the whole whole project. Uh, on that particular case, is, is a client-initiated change, not, not from us. But that could flip on us too, if we don't really identify those things properly. Uh, we ended up uh, getting into a lot of uh, complexity. Uh, plan review revisions, uh, we kind of alluded to that a little bit. In our scope and our cost of breakdown, we want to be really clear. We're saying two rounds of review on 30%, or, or however that is. If there's more than two rounds, you can go back to the clients and say, hey, we already addressed you. Uh, also, we want you to combine your, your uh, comments so that it's not piecemeal to us. When you're piecemeal, we, we, can, we can decline to accept your comments, which is a hope. Wait until. Uh, you have all your comments to us before we react to it. So allow us to manage the two rounds of review revisions uh, to stay with the scope of work and with our cost. Otherwise, you can, there's a too many reasons to go back to them. Oversight time, the QQC we talked about. Uh, in our estimate, that, that happened to me all the time, because we're so pressured to stay with a certain budget to reduce our cost. And I can reduce the 40 hours for a designer, that's so no way I'm going to reduce that. What ended up always happened is the QQC managers are going to shift slash. Uh, is that a good practice or bad practice? I think it's a bad, bad practice, but that's always, the pressure is always uh, 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 pushing to to have those costs uh, got reduced. Uh, how to solve that is something that we have to be mindful of. <clears throat> Increase the backup and uh, equal easier negotiate. That's your point. Uh, I, I learned a lot of, from Rick on that. You got to have your your information backup in place. Uh, when you have more backup, you become more credible. Uh, people tend to be able to kind of go along with your argument. Um, sometimes if we don't do our due diligence, we ended up taking a lot of hours away. Uh, that's it, right? Yeah. Okay. You're going to run a little late, but that's okay. Right. Two minutes, you get two more minutes. Well, if anyone really wants to walk out, you're welcome to. <laughs> But you won't get a diploma. <laughs> so let, let's talk about um, negotiations because that some are simple, some get complicated. Try never to make it personal or contentious. Um, what I try to do is is put points across to the client that make them feel like 
if they don't do certain things or read a certain things, they're, they're going to have a problem and not get what they want. And you have to do that in a, in a polite way. So there's a couple of things that um, are starting point. One, they want to be listened to. Before I do that, I want to give you a few things just so you have them in your hands. So that's one, and this is the second. So this is just one sheet. One, yeah, one sheet. And this is also one sheet. And, this, and I'll be quick on this. And um, what this is showing you, this is kind of to that last point Peter made, increased backup equals easier negotiation for a few reasons. One, it looks like you have your act together, uh, but also the nature of, especially of the government, but honestly any client, the person that's negotiating is being judged on, on hey, you know, I gotta save money. It's not, it's, I'm gonna say it's almost like sport. Yeah. Then, as opposed to a real process of finding the right number. Somebody gave them a budget, may or may not be right, right, but if they don't take some money away from you, it looks like they, they didn't do their job, even if your mm -hmm. fee is properly estimated. So what I found is you have to make it easier for them to do a little picking on stuff. As a KT is an MI. <laughs> yeah, and so if you look at that first sheet I gave you, Imagine if you handed the client, just look at the top of it, where it's boxed out. Imagine if you just gave a client that and said 42 hours of civil and 36 hours of mechanical and this and that. They're going to go, I don't know, 42 seems high. I thought had it at 24. Okay? And you're going to go, oh boy. But now, look at that backup sheet, because that those are the same thing. That backup sheet, and, and some of them get broken way more detailed than that. It starts to look at every little thing, and you have to be clever when you craft what that work breakdown structure is, so every line item looks necessary. Okay, and because we don't assign 15 minutes to an item, put an hour or two. But when you add enough of them, they add up to a big number. So now you get the reviewer looking at that and going, I don't know, seems to me like you could do that in six instead of eight. And you go, uh, well, let me hear everything you have to say first. But by the time you're done, they picked on five things and it amounted to four hours instead of instead of just one big number looks bad because they're seeing this stuff in front of them. So this is a very effective tool. The other thing I do for a negotiation is I have notes to the side that have probably two or three bullets for almost every one of those line items. Because they'll go, well, what are you doing on that one? Well, we have to get this sheet broken out, then I have to do, and, and you can explain it with one more. And the, the reality is we know more than the reviewer most of the time. <coughs> so that's that's just one point about how to how to prepare for those things. Those things. I also want to pass this. <coughs> as we'll refer to this. This is I should put a heading on it. This is the revised proposal of the one that I. <coughs> but so in, in in the point of the second one is scope reduction is the best way to reduce fees. If a client gets our proposal and says, hey, you know what, 96000 is <coughs> way too much for that job. And I say, well, let me give you a revised proposal, and I give him a revised one of 84. What's the first thing that goes through his mind? Why is he gouging me at 96 if he can then change it to 84 that easy? So my approach is, our approach should be, okay, what I can say, you know what, let me work with you. Maybe there's some things I can reduce if I can get somebody else to do it, or if you agree that you're just going to be short on that, it may be a problem later for you. And so if you look at this revised proposal, this is a good example, a simple one, of why we reduced the fee from 90 whatever it was to 72. By the way, the guy wanted it for 60 something. I didn't give in all the way. I said, some stuff you absolutely need. And they went, this is great, thank you. But what I did, everything that's reduced in there is attached to us doing less. So I yellowed out a number of things in here. The primary adjustments allow us to do it because in all those red box things, we're now, we're only doing a simple plan review and attending one meeting. In the previous scope, we actually had some work we were doing. Very clear about the meeting. Uh, we've eliminated right-of-way drawings and legal descriptions for blah, 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 as this would, by the way, they absolutely need that stuff and they know it, but it's like we got it out of our fee. And that's okay, because it's in a bucket over here, and the way they're comparing us is like this, and so it'll be an add-on later. 
Um, you can see that we're expecting a cat um, drawing from them that has the layout. We're having the owner or his representative do the fire department coordination. We've reduced the time for meetings. So now just flipping through this thing, let's just hit the yellow so we can go through quick. And you'll see no drawings, but rather attend one meeting, attend two meetings. All these things have limitations on them. Attend two. Um, and then there's things about assumptions will hold true. In other words, if, if the uh, architect's plan, cat file's messed up, he has to change it, we have to reduce something. Change order. Um, limiting our effort to, and then the exclusions in here were similar to what I had before. So those remain. And that, all those things that we took out that were direct effort of ours resulted in a, in a reduction fee. Now we tracked that meeting time and and I'm going, hey, I think you guys might need to do a change order for a <coughs> meeting time if you want us there. But, you know, I didn't want to be difficult for these people. I went and offered and did this. Got two surveyors there nearby, and I got the surveyor to give them direct proposals. I reviewed the proposals for them, recommended which surveyor to pick. So they think we're the most helpful people. So it's not like I was just taking stuff out. It's like still trying to be a team member, and that stuff was easy to do for nothing. So, yeah, right. and I know your yeah. comment to say, uh, uh, attend two meetings. Those are things that are easier to define, right? Because when it's a two or three meeting, you can put the hour and the cost to it. What happened, if you want to limit your exposure to some things, not easy to define. For example, uh, coordination with the other agencies like that. How do you limit that? The way to do that is what he says here, uh, did here. You can, you can spell out how many hours. We're going to co uh, perform coordinations between the agencies up to 20 hours. And that gives you a box to work with, even though the, t the task itself is very hard to, to really define. There's no stopping point per se, but you can, you can, you can uh, put yourself in a box of a number of hours. And that's, that's OK, yeah. too. And most developers will keep increasing that budget if they see that you're moving up and moving the project along and that it's a difficult one to get through. I've never really had a big problem with that. Um, some of those fees, like on big projects, started off just for the coordination, might have been 20 or 30,000, and I've change ordered them up to 120,000. Because like, you know, if you're doing a 500 unit project and it's ongoing at community meetings and this and that, they recognize all that and I just track it along the way, and I get close and I said, hey, I think we need a supplement, a supplement to that. Okay, send me a change order. That's so, very applicable to Patty. Yeah. And a lot of stuff you do. Uh, it, it's very hard to cut off, uh, you know, at some point in terms of defining your exposure of the work. And those kind of techniques you could use. Yeah, in this case where I said another consultant on the team may be able to handle. So there was a couple things I put back on the owner. If you go handle the fire department and you go do this, we don't have to go there. And you just give us the stuff. And the reality is when we get the stuff, you know, just give me what he's doing. And then we can decide later if we should go with him or not, just to make sure that it doesn't cause us bigger problems by not being in there. But, um, you know, we could, we could spend all day on this kind of stuff. But I think the idea in the situation <coughs> is that we have a position, and we ran that fee, and we saw certain things. And so to cave quickly is not, it is, it affects our credibility that we didn't know what we were doing. Now there are times where you can, if you're doing enough, where you can sit there with the client and go, hey, you know what? That is a good point. I understand what you're saying. And I looked for a little win to give them because they like to be agreed. <coughs> but the things I'll do that on are probably small. And I'll say, you know what, I think you're right. I think we may have overestimated that item. But it's not going to affect the big fee, but it's going to give them a win. You know, you always hear about win-win negotiation. They've got them out of there knowing that they got to check off a couple of things that were their position. It's just the way human nature is, right? But everybody's bought a car. Unless you go to CarMax now. <coughs> you a car, it's a little gamesmanship and everybody has to feel they got something. And everyone I know in my entire life that bought a car and negotiated a car got a phenomenal deal. Mm, I don't know. And the guy on the other side's thinking, I just sold the car, you know? but. Everybody has to feel their little win. And so you have to recognize that, that the client needs to feel that same thing and give them a couple. 
So, Rick, did you encounter the debate about the travel time? I've encountered that many times, yeah. Chargeable, not chargeable, buildable, not buildable. Um, well, there are certain things that are very clear with the federal. So some of it, you can't do it. Okay, so some of it, you're only getting a travel if you're a certain distance away. That's the expense of the travel itself, not the time spent driving. So how do I deal with that? I look for other ways. I say, okay, but that field investigation that I'm going to negotiate a day for, I really only need five hours. So I got it figured out. There are other times where it's more of a challenge. Take the survey at China Lake. It takes those or uh, Bridgeport, sorry. It takes those guys all day to drive up there and come back. So that one is like I got to find a way to get five days of survey negotiated for three days of work, and it was fixed fee, and we were successful on that. And then I even got the consultant who did the work for us. So I go, hey, wait, 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 you don't need that much time out there. I'll give you the extra day over what you need here, but. Um, because I know you're going to drive up there. And so we were able to work that out and fit in inside of our budget. But it, you got to get clever, get back to your third seat there, right? you got to get creative about how you do things. And the, the other thing is the more you know a client, like I can tell you over the years, I had some major, major Navy housing work being done in the 90s. And if the person across the table from me was a civil engineer and contracts person, and we're negotiating the renovation of an entire Navy housing site, and there's a big landscape architect component. The civil engineer just does not see, well, what do those guys do? They just name the plants, right? So if I know, and I already know who I'm dealing with, as you know, you deal with the design manager and those guys, so it's not like they're a surprise person to show up. I put my feet together when I know that guy's on it, and I'm heavy on mechanical, heavy on civil, light on, Landscape. So when I get my fees from my landscape architect, I take half of them and I move them other places. And they're going, yeah, that seems reasonable. That seems reasonable. Okay, your landscape seems reasonable. Okay, now I'm doing this and a landscape architect is running the job. I did the opposite. I take civil stuff to the civil engineer. This is a landscape job. They're just helping a little drainage. So you have to know who's know your audience. So I take those hours and I drop <laughs> them over here. And then I'm, because they don't pick on their own. They pick on everybody else, right? The landscape guy, what's he do? He's doing tree stamps. Come on, right? But so you have to kind of know who your audience is if you're lucky enough to have that opportunity. Most of the time you are. Most of the time you know who's, who you're going to negotiate with. Maybe in selection you don't always know. But once you're working to the fee portion, you kind of know who's across the table and what their hot buttons are. So you try to play to that as much as you can uh, if you know them. Otherwise, you may have a learning experience, you know. So, and a lot, and I don't see, you know, I've had some where, um, where it's almost like I'm not going to debate. I'm going, oh, you know, I just feel silent. You know, it's like I don't know how, how you're going to, how we're going to get your job done. Yeah, this two minutes, and now this is just turned to, hey, this is a different reaction than an argument. This is like, oh, what's my job going to get done? And I found that people are more apt to listen. The funniest negotiation I've ever had, because sometimes in government they bring rookies into a negotiation, was I turned a fee in, and this person goes, uh, "This fee is just is just way too high." And I said, "Well, I mean, I'm open to listen to what you say. I'm not saying we're perfect, and we're open to adjustments if, if there's something we misunderstood. But do you have a counter position?" She goes, "No, I, I'd like a counter position from you." Well, you have our position sitting in front of you. Yeah, but I need a can. I said, well, uh, and right now the contracts person is silent, which surprised me. I thought they would butt in at that point. I went, well, I can give you a counter proposal, but we're going to move one dollar at a time. And that's when the contracts person said, Rick, can I put you on hold for a minute? And that was, I think, the lecture started there. It's like. We're going to need to call you back tomorrow morning. Is that okay? And so, you know, you, you don't just give in because people think something's too low. Well, you think it's too low? I, I think it's I think it's tight, but we can do it. So you have to have some conviction. The only way to do that is you got to know your stuff. You got to be prepared. You got to know the material. If you start going, 
when they say, what are you going to do for that? You're going, uh, you don't look good. So to me, it's about notes and bullets. And when they ask that, you go, oh, I'll tell you what we're doing. And it comes off smooth as if you understand it, not that you're reading your notes. And so that's, it's, there's an art to it. And, um, and you get better at it in time. And you have to be patient. You can't feel like, I've got to resolve this like right now. If it, if it must, it's like, I, I don't know, maybe we should go back and think about some of this and reconvene later today or tomorrow. And, that, and, and keep, keep the heat down and make people absorb things. So again, we could do a whole session on this, but the, the key point is don't just cave because somebody thinks it's too high if you feel that you've estimated it correctly, but also be open to, to what they have to say. Um, let's speak to change orders a little bit. There was a couple exercises that we were going to do, but I think we'll just we'll, we'll move right by it. But how do you identify a change order? How do you guys? Any example of change order? Maybe we should scope. But do you look at the scope every time the client talks to you? Know your scope. Know your scope. Yeah. That's a good start. <laughs> We're the best start. Default checkpoint. <laughs> yeah. So if you know your scope, when they start asking for stuff, you're going, hey, wait a minute. But then, do you want to be on the phone? That's not the contract. That's not the contract. You, you have to be very careful about everything you do. Because a little extra for a client is a good sales pitch. So if I think something's small, but maybe it's out of scope, but it's early in the job, what I might do is go, you know, I don't, I'm pretty sure we didn't have this in the scope, but. I'll tell you what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of this for you, but I just want to kind of go on record and just note this for you because down the road, if a bunch of these come up, I may have to come back to you with a change order. So you've sort of primed the pump that um, you're going to give them something, but you're telling the guy, be careful about how much you keep asking for. You know, and, and they get that message. And then at some point, they might say, hey, I need some help from you. I, I, I'm, like yesterday, I got with Northrop, or two days ago, Northrop Grumman. Kennedy and I were on this call, and they had all these changes that are going over on the screen, and so we're going to have to revise some drawings, and it's owner changes and all that. And we're looking at it going, I'm on mute, we're going, this is simple, most of this. There was a couple of things in there. And we probably would have just sucked that one up because they've given us a lot of change orders when we've pushed it. Um, but it's almost like they're trained. The next note I get was, hey, can you, you're probably going to want to send me a proposal with a, with a CEO request for this and this. So just see if you can get that to me quick, that'd be great. I'm going, wow, these people are trained. You know, and so now we're going to have an opportunity to get, get a little extra. If we need it, I got another little problem, right? Maybe I want to trade it. Kim, you guys have been good to us on this thing. We're not going to ask for a change order there, but I do have a change on our, on our stormwater runs. You know, something like that. So you have to be delicate. You're always balancing these things. but. Um, you know, the biggest thing is you got to watch the scope creep. So little items turn into big dollars. That's why it's called creep. If somebody came in and dropped a monster change on you, everybody knows it and you're going to get a change order. If they just keep asking you for one more little thing, one more little thing, pretty soon it's like $50,000. I mean, I see a lot of firms get in big trouble on doing work out of scope. What's the value? of my change order when I'm done with the work. Zero, right? Yeah, or it's certainly discounted. <laughs> yes, right? I already know so, your product. Yeah, yeah I because, there because, there because if I'm here, I'm going, hey, I need a change order, and I need to know we at least have a tenant agreement on some numbers, and I'll jump. And so I put it there, go, I'm going to move that forward, but I'm not going to change it. Okay, we're good, and I'll maybe help them. But if it's just keep going and going, going and going and I get out here now the value of that work is if it should have been 50,000 in their mind no you didn't know 50, that's what I 405 experience yeah <laughs> exactly what he's describing <laughs> and, and I'm gonna say what my what my mother would always say to me on this one do as I say not as I do we're not all perfect on these <laughs> things right we don't always catch what we should um, but it, but it's most people are not offended <laughs> You ask for change order if it's reasonable. When we start picking on every little exhibit or every little thing, we have to use our judgment about what's real. So some things are very clear. Um, 
some things are a change of direction. All of the meeting we had this week, we want security over here, and we want these turnstiles here. And now the guy's like, and we designed them all. Well, now we're thinking we might want to put one turnstile there and one over there. Now we've got more design work to do. So the direction has clearly changed, even though the overall scope of the work didn't increase. So stop condos in the slab or not showing that. <laughs> now you're showing that. Those are the change of decisions made by the client. <laughs> Special assignments. Again, I'll use Northrop because this happened. We're doing some truck turning stuff for them, and somebody in Northrop loves what we did, so they're like, ooh, you know what? I've got like five other places, not on your project site, but over there. Could you guys truck turn all those for us too? And, and there's some cab work and stuff. It's like, yeah, no problem. So, and they expect a fee for it. So, special assignments. So now I turn that. They, those could be anything. So, when do you inform the client? Talk about it a little bit. I let them know as soon as I can, even if the paper's not processed, just so they're on notice, they know it's coming, and they acknowledge it. And then try to work the dollars as fast as I can. You have to recognize where the project is. If it's something that's in construction, and you're going to twiddle your thumbs on it, you might do more damage to your company's reputation by stopping up the works than keeping the project going. But, but if you get it to them quickly, they're also going, hey, come on, I need that change order. Keep moving. I'm kind of out on a limb. Then, then they'll tend to move it through quicker. So the value is maximized before you do the work, ideally, right? Because they need it. Um, and it goes down in time, just like collections. The longer you have a receivable out there, the probability Beyond a certain point, the probability of collecting the full amount goes down because everybody's a little fuzzy on what you did. Maybe it's not worth that much. And we had taken 80% payment and call it even. And you know what? A lot of times people will do that because they're tired of chasing it. They get worn down instead of sticking to their guns, right? Yeah. So, so that's pretty much that. I know that was like place to. Is there any questions or comments on that? Um, well, my comment is that uh, those are all those are good uh, life lessons of uh, those stuff. But uh, it's a learned skill and a practice skill. Uh, I, I wanted to emphasize that. Yeah, everybody can learn those things. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, there's there's you, you gotta have the practice books. And all yeah. That. yeah, I wanted to go back to this one slide because we didn't talk about this triangle. <coughs> You'll see this triangle show up in a number of different ways. Usually it's the triangle that has cost, schedule, or time, and quality as opposed to scope. It'll say quality, cost, time. And the general rule of thumb in the industry is you can provide, you can give two out of three. Okay, so if I want, if I'm the client and I want a super high quality job, I can get you high quality at a high cost, but the higher the quality, I'm probably not going to make your time schedule, right? I can get you a decent cost to meet your schedule. It could affect the quality. You might have a Volkswagen instead of a Cadillac. And, and if you look at that and you run those scenarios, you'll see it's, it's hard to get all three in perfect balance for, you know, the client can't get the greatest job on earth for the lowest price done quickly. It just doesn't work. And so, again, you'll see that in a whole bunch of different forms, but it's always the triangle, and it's got those things. Sometimes I'll pop one word into the middle and still have three outside, but it's a, I think it's a good thing to remember when people are asking you for, to give me the best job you can do in 10 Well, that doesn't mean your schedule's not gonna work. Or uh, it's gonna cost a little more. They have to understand those other two things don't stay fixed if you want to keep changing those things. So, should I hit that before? But. <laughs> yeah, that's good for Katie, you have some comments? You know, one thing, oh yeah, here, you know, come to change the order, right? I think the one thing that the Mosul Arch um, kind of failed to do is to identify. Yeah, recognize it. Early. To yeah. recognize the change of order and set the evidence. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. Set the evidence, all right? So, uh, you know, for example, on the Bobo 9 section 2, we are doing right now, actually, there are a lot of evidence that support our change of order, right? All right. But we did not follow it up. 
from beginning. Okay. Yeah. So be very important for PM to identify if it's change order. How do you set up the case? Yeah. Once the both steps are set up, it's easier later on. Okay? Mm -hmm. If you know the instruction from your client, you know, ask you to do this one, to do you respond in email. Please conform, this is what you instruct us to do. And tell them that you know our action would proceed upon your confirmation. Mm -hmm. Then you know every celebrate for yourself to protect yourself. Yeah. And that fits yeah. perfectly because most clients will tell you, I don't want you doing any extra work without authorization. Right. Well, yes. here I'm showing you the extra work and I need the authorization. Yes. Right? I mean it's kind of right. exactly right. yeah. And the evidence, that's that's a really good word because at the point we identify, we know what that stuff is. And it gets fuzzier as time goes on and really hard to construct. And I don't know about you, I mean, how many how many times have you had something done or even anything personal and all of a sudden this bill comes late? It's like, what the heck is that for? <laughs> Time's gone by, you, you no longer recognize what it is. You know? and so, you know, you want to get it while it's hot. You, me out of there, right? Yeah, I did. Why? No, no, I didn't. Okay. So, just maybe a quick summary of the day is understand the lay of the land, right? When we're talking about um, scope of work and who we're working with, what are the client goals, jurisdiction requirements, clear assumptions. We want to stay away from the ambiguous stuff and, and really make it understood what we're doing and then under what assumptions, what exclusions, but also not to look like we're a, we don't, you, everybody's seen Mrs. Doubtfire, right? Okay, and, he's, and they're interviewing, they're interviewing the potential nannies, and the one woman is at the door going, I don't clean, I don't do this, I don't wash dishes, I don't do, so she was very clear on her exclusions. And then the response was, thank you very much, we'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. That's how we look. And so, we don't want to look that way, we want to look like, well, I'm, right now I'm assuming that you're not going to need that, but if you do, we can talk about it. It's more more that spirit. Close the gaps with other team members. So we, we talked about a number of those things. We kind of know what those gaps are, but we're trying to get our proposal out, you know. And so sometimes it's it's easier said than done. <clears throat> but if you can't, then it's still not a bad thing to point things out to the client. Um, you know, we would suggest that you. You know, here's our scope. We suggest that you, after you cross-check all the consultants, that if there's any gaps, blah blah blah, we'd be happy to meet and help you. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do to look like you're helping them. Oh, hey, I better check that. You can only get two out of three. Reducing scope is the best way to reduce a fee. I don't want to say it's the only way because we're not always right on every item. Sometimes we go over, um, just in the same way we underestimate things, and sometimes we overestimate things. So. Yeah, sometimes you have, you, the good, the is you have to anticipate reducing fees. So when you first go in front of a client, you got to build in some places where you can come down. Glad you said that, because that's, high. that's so <laughs> you important. You got to know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, in those negotiation down. notes you would yeah. do ahead of time, mm -hmm. you want to identify where your give points are. Regular, you know, nowadays, you know, what I'm doing is I don't want to use a reduction. I want to use modify. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Modify the score yeah. to reduce the fee. Correct. Yeah, we would never just tell the client, yeah, we can reduce our fee. <laughs> our fee can change, can be modified if we reduce the scope. So, the twins, right? And then we just made that point before about capture that scope creep without appearing greedy. I know, Travis, we had a view, I think, where the guys were doing some exhibits, and you guys said, hey, this looks like a change order. But when we looked at the big context, it's like, you guys, it's probably going to take us an hour and a half. And they're not going to process a change order for an hour and a half. You know, let's, we'll wait for the big one to get this done for them. So you got to kind of weigh how you treat a client and, and what you get in exchange for it. And then recognize too we get out of a lot of stuff. So that's I think that's um, yeah, that was it. 
So very, very good. Full speed, I know. <laughs> <laughs> any, any final questions or? Um, yeah. You know, Rick, I would like to add, you know, uh, one point. This kind of thing is not engineering. It's <laughs> art. Okay. It is. And uh, for all of you, you know, with experience and the college degree, you can learn the process and become an artist. Okay. In developing this kind of thing. And through the process, you will know how to ship the buckets, okay, balance the buckets. At the end, you know, we are in business of making money. We are not in charity, all right? So keep that in mind that, you know, you are also helping yourself, okay, uh, to help the company's goals and also to elevate yourself to manage a larger project. It's almost like you knew that tied right back to people <laughs> and results, <laughs> right? No, those are excellent closing points. So, do you guys like the idea of, of having some books picked out now and then too to yes. go through and get some exposure to things maybe you didn't see before that give a different perspective? And I think they help you a lot in the workplace.